the story of the Santa Clarita Valley, the upper Santa Clara River Valley. It's a bombastic saga. Across this land have strode bronzed hunters in search of mammoths, blue-coated Spanish explorers. There have been gray-robed Franciscan priests and dons ruling an empire of cattle of a thousand hills. Hi. I'm Jerry Reynolds. I'm the curator of the Historical Society and past president. With me on this journey through the sort of a walk, you might say, through the history of the valley is Mr. Tom Frew, a third generation resident of the area. In fact, his grandfather was the village blacksmith here back in the 1890s. Tom, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us on the next few minutes on this walk through the valley history. Thanks, Jerry. Perhaps we should start our journey right here at Vasquez Rocks County Park. This is the site where Tiburcio Vasquez, famed bandit, holed up after some of his escapades in the San Fernando Valley. Legend has it that there's a treasure buried here somewhere. These <clears throat> hills have seen John Charles Fremont travel through, 49ers in search of gold, settlers, dusty paths and super highways. If this area looks familiar, it should. These rocks have been seen in movies for many, many years, dating back to Tom Mix and William S. Hart, who chased the black-hatted bad guys through these canyons. More recently, Wonder Woman bounced across the rocks out here. Captain Kirk beamed down from the Starship Enterprise on more than one occasion to this area. The movie Short Circuit was filmed here. Also, many, many TV commercials have happened in this area over a period of years. I think really the best place to start was with a map to give our viewers an idea of uh, where we're at and point out some of the places we'll be visiting along in the next uh, few minutes during this tape. Good, let's take a look. In the northern area of Los Angeles County is located the Santa Clara River Valley. Looking like a tree, the main part of the trunk formed by the Santa Clara River, the upper parts formed by the canyons of Aguadulce, Soledad, Bouquet, Castake, Placerita, and the town of Newhall, Canyon Country, Saugus, Castake, Valencia, and Aguadulce and Acton over here on the far side are all included in this area. I can really think of no area that has been more uh, influenced by its geology than the uh, Santa Clara River Valley. Uh, the mountain barriers to the south, the San Gabriels down here, and the Tehachapis to the north prove really formidable, not only to the Indians, but early pioneers. And of course, this knife slit uh, coming across at the top is the famous San Andreas Rift Zone. Because of this, there's been what they call seismic events that have changed the mountains and uplifted the land and uh, brought up some rather interesting fossils along the way. And Tom Fru will show us some of the fossils found in the Santa Clara Valley. Here are some of the fossils that were found in this area. This is a whale vertebra. You'll see a shell that dates back some 13 million years. Fossilized fish, shark's teeth, and these are crenoids or sea lilies. These and many other shells abound in the rocks in this area. The sound of water, indeed the lure of water. This attracted animals thousands and thousands of years ago. This in turn attracted people, hunters, who may have gathered in this region oh, as far back as 18,000 BC. We don't have any definite evidence of the first human beings to come wandering into the valley. We know that they were here, they were chasing giant ground sloths, mammoths, mastodons, these great ice age beasts that you would find, say, in the La Brea tar pits. Occasionally, such as a mammoth tusk comes to light around here, and once in a while, a human artifact. Now, you might be just walking along and notice a rock and say, hey, that's just another chunk of rock. But look closely, it's been worked. As I turn it in the light, you can see there are edges on it. This is a heavy chopping stone that would have been used by oh, human beings who knows how long ago because of the fact that there's no way to date a rock. But you see it fits into the hand just right. 
made for a right-handed person. And you have these heavy edges on here. You can break through bones. Uh, you can uh, use it for hammering, all sorts of handy devices. Another one, a little bit smaller, would be this which again you can see there's a groove to fit your finger into you can use this for cutting skins it's still quite sharp uh, you could almost uh, shave with it even today and again it just handily fits into your hand just right to be used for a cutting tool or perhaps for defense if somebody happened to be attacking you these ancient hunters uh, were driven away by new arrivals, uh, which we nowadays call Tatavium, that popped into this valley about 450 to 500 A.D. This is the same time as the Roman Empire was falling apart. These new arrivals, the Tataviums, we know a little bit more about. We found considerable more relics. For example, around these springs in this flat area, there was a village of perhaps 500 or more people. And certainly, they would have been attracted to this area Area because in their religion they considered water as a source of life and behind me is a large rock and oozing from the rock itself a spring this would have been considered extremely sacred because it was the wellspring the birth of life let's go over and take a look at the rock at Agua Dulce Springs this would have been considered, this rock that we see here, something of a, a shrine, you might say a church in modern terms, because of the fact that water was actually oozing out of it. And uh, this would attract Indians from all over the place, probably out in the Antelope Valley and down here uh, for ceremonial reasons. Once it was covered with uh, paintings, uh, those are pretty much gone now. And there are little uh, carvings, uh, niches in the rock. These would uh, have held uh, Indian images. Uh, fetishes, you might say, or little statuettes and things like this. There's even a thought that this might be considered something like Lourdes, uh, where people would come and actually, uh, you know, give something to the gods of the waters, you might say, for healing them. So let's go over and take a close look at this rock and the actual water oozing out of the ground. Over the past thousand years or so, this valley has been drying up and the ecology has been changing. It is very rare that you find these springs uh, actually oozing out of the rock, probably because of the heavy rains this year that it's functioning. It gives you some idea of the way this would have looked to the first Indian settlers when they came here to test the waters. Also, it was visited by a Spaniard, uh, uh, Pedro Fages, in 1772. Fages came up Soledad Canyon looking for some army deserters who had run off with a group of comely young Indian ladies and he stopped by here tasted the waters and called them agua dulce sweet water and now we're going to go over to another section of the park to be joined by Tom Frew in a discussion of the local Indians and we'll take a look at some actual rock art Jerry what can you tell me about these artifacts Here's a matate, which would be used for grinding up uh, various edible grains around the area here, uh, buckwheat, and certainly acorns from oak trees. It was the oak acorn that was the staple of the Indians' diet. They would grind it up using matate and a mano, or a handstone, or a pestle. And with this, you would create a sort of meal out of the acorns. Then it would have to be leached to get rid of the very bitter tannic acid. And then, of course, processed into sort of a gruel, which would be eaten. In front of the matate, we have a Indian basket, which is very finely woven, and uh, I think you can pick out some of the designs on it. This again would be made by the native uh, materials around here, such as the grasses and weeds that we see in back of us. All this is resting on a coyote skin, which is also still native to us around here. In the basket, we have a little string of beads. Uh, these, perhaps uh, 1,000 to 1,500 years old, are made of steatite, which is a very hard, durable type of stone. For hunting, they would have these small uh, bird points, projectile points, or arrowheads, if you please. Uh, this sort of thing wouldn't be used to hunt down a deer, or certainly not a grizzly bear, but more for small game, uh, for rabbits and squirrels and such as that. Generally, most Indians avoided the use of uh, reptiles. They had religious taboos against that. Well, is this from a native stone? The stone is discovered, well, about 10 miles east of us here in the Sierra Polonas. The steatite is there. Also, this is red-fused shale, which is also a native 
native to that area. But of course they did trade a lot. There have been items found around here that have come in from the Colorado River Desert and of course from Catalina Island and the Channel Islands as far as that goes. So there was extensive trade networks up and down through the Santa Clara Valley. Now in back of the Matate, after looking at some of these things, we're able to sort of piece together perhaps the way these people lived uh, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, but more or less about the time the Spaniards arrived. The women would spend most of their days grinding up acorns on an object such as this, and the gentlemen would be spending their time chipping, which would take an awful lot of time, chipping arrowheads. And then what was left, they would be out hunting for game and whatnot. Usually the children would be taken care of by a teenage girl. That would leave mom free to prepare the deep meal all day. Once in a while, the uh, men would dress up in some very spectacular costumes. They would put on these bonnets made of condor and flicker feathers and these long iridescent capes uh, that actually shined and glimmered as they walked. These again were made of bird plumage. As for their daily activities, they would be spent in a house such as this, which is made of grass and reeds and sycamores, and uh, this would be called a wickiup. Also, they had an underground dwelling uh, made of earth, kind of like adobe, and uh, this had a bench inside for the people to sit and sleep on. So this is generally the way you would uh, find a typical Tatavium village in the, say, 1500s or whatever. Good. Now let's go look at the pictographs. Yeah, those... right side by here, aren't they? Yeah, just right up the hill here. I noticed as we walked up the trail, Jerry, there were dabs of paint along on the faces of some of the rocks, but they didn't seem very well defined. Yeah, well, they're more exposed to the elements, the wind and the rain, and uh, probably wore off. Uh, back here in this overhang, you can see this little sun design back in here, which is protected by this cavern that we're in. Uh, it'd be hard to say how old this thing was, uh, maybe a thousand years it's been there. Of course, the Indians would use native berries, which would be rather long-lasting. Also on the rocks, you can see other little daubs and chains and ladders and men running around with funny-shaped hands that look like rakes. They say that a lot of uh, tribes, when the boys became initiated into the rites of manhood, they would give them the root of this certain uh, flower, which was a very strong hallucinogen. And the boys would then uh, have these weird psychedelic dreams and paint these things on the rocks after that as part of their rites of passage, so to speak. Probably if we look around a little bit, we can probably find some bedrock mortars around here someplace. Why don't we see if we can? These are very small mortars in the rocks here, Jerry. Now these, uh, if they did use them to grind up Datura root, uh, they wouldn't grind, grind up that uh, great of a volume of the stuff. So uh, you would just have a small one. They're uh, sort of scattered around here and there under these rock underhangs. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you pointed out, you just take and grind something up with them. Maybe you can pick up an actual grinding sound. But then, not too far away, there's some other rock paintings over here. Maybe we can pick up on camera. Good. Let's see if we can see them. Jerry, what do you think this is? I really don't know. Some sort of painted figure. The archaeologists always refer to these things as figures with raked hands. And if you can see close on there, you can see there's four little raked fingers sticking up. I don't know if it's supposed to be some animal. Uh, lizards to some tribes were sacred. They thought that they carried messages off to the gods. Might be a lizard. Might be a human being. Kind of hard to tell. Just a stick figure. It's amazing that with the berries that they use for dye or paint, that these figures have lasted this long. Yeah, really. And uh, hopefully not too many people will find out about them or else they'll all be defaced. <laughs> yes, that's true. That, that's too bad. It really is. Well, about ready to go down to Castaic and await the arrival of Portola and his troops? <laughs> sure, let's go. Tying the Santa Clara Valley from the Sierra Polonas over to Ventura is the Santa Clara River which flows directly behind me at the moment. This is the lifeline, or was for many years, for the people who lived here. Not only pioneer settlers, but back to the days of the Indians. About 25 villages were scattered up and down the Santa Clara River. One of the largest rancherias, or villages, was at this spot where we're standing now. It was called Chaguyabit, and about 500 or so people lived here at one time. It was here, in August of 1769, that they finally came face to face with those strange, tall, strangers that they had heard so much about. They had certainly been told about the sailboats that went up and down the Colorado River, and naturally the great sailing vessels that had put into the port 
with Ventura. But now here they were, coming over Fremont Pass, across through New Hall, Saugus, and Valencia to this very spot. Members of the Portola Party. I can well imagine this sight of this flag was about as startling to the primitive Tatavium Indians as a flying saucer dropping down in the middle of Valencia would be today. But here they were, 64 people mounted on horses carrying the imperial flag of Spain, the crossed lions and castles with the garter of the Knights of the Golden Fleece. Portola and the Indians seemed to get along quite well. They exchanged goods, they made numerous comments on each other's apparel, and while they were here, one of the members of the Portola party, Father Juan Crespe, stood about at this spot, looked out over the river, and named it for the feast day of St. Clair, the Rio Santa Clara. After the, another day or two, the party packed up and they moved on down the riverbed toward Ventura, and eventually wound up founding Monterey. A few years later, 1797, the Mission San Fernando was established, and all of this land became part of Mission Holdings. The cattle grazed here, the Indians were brought in and taught useful trades. And then in 1804, on a little hill, just above us back in this direction, almost due west, a small granary was set up. In the fall of 1804, two Franciscan padres were dispatched from Mission San Fernando up to the Santa Clarita Valley to set up a granary. This was built on the spot that you're looking at now, Low Ridge, next to the river, at near, not too far from Castaic Junction. A few years later, about 1810, it was upgraded to Assistentia status. This meant that it was a submission, and it was called the Assistentia de San Francisco. The whole valley referred to at that time as Rancho San Francisco. The Indians were brought in to help build the new submission, which had two long wings, about 118 feet long, and it was about 64 feet across the front. There was a central courtyard or patio with a gated walkway and wall at the front and at the back. Here, too, the Indians learned such useful trades as growing wheat and crops, rounding up cattle, and, of course, making roofing and floor tiles. One room in the building did have floor tiles in it and a whitewashed wall, indicating that it must have been used as a sanctuary. The buildings itself lasted quite a while, but in the 1820s, the missions were all sacralized after Mexico became independent of Spain and California, a province of Mexico. After the missions were secularized, this whole area was granted to one man, a lieutenant in the Mexican army. His name was Antonio Del Valle. Del Valle took over the old Asistencia site and made it his home. It was then known as the Casa de Rancho de San Francisco, and Del Valle moved his wife and five children into the hilltop. He didn't live long enough to enjoy his new prosperity, but long enough. He owned 48,000 acres, that is everything from Piru Creek clear over to uh, canyon country today. Before you received a grant of land in old Mexican California, first you had to have a map. This map was drawn by a friend of Del Valle's in Santa Barbara, and why it may look to you like sort of a dead cow or an amoeba, actually if you look at it close you can make out exactly what's going on here. At the far left, this line is Piru Creek. The squiggle coming down the center of the valley is the Santa Clara River. The legs sticking up, such as this one, is Castaque. This one is San Francisco, Bouquet, Soledad, and Placerita Canyons. See, it all makes sense, doesn't it? Also, you would register your brand. This is the registered brand of the Don's son, Ignacio Del Valle. As I mentioned, Don Antonio didn't have too long to enjoy his rancho. He died in 1842, most of it going to his son, who inherited most of the 48,000 acres that now makes up the Santa Clara River Valley. Now we're standing in the shade of the Oak of the Golden Dream at the north edge of the Placerita State Park. Um, this is the site where Francisco Lopez first discovered gold here in California, a strike that was actually years before the strike at Sutter's Mill.
Jerry, why don't you tell us a little bit about that area, about that time, and, and what was happening? Well, it was the spring of 1842 when the rancheros out here would round up all their cattle, bring them in from the range for branding. And at this time, all the relatives would come out to the ranchos to help out with the roundups and the branding and everything like this. Uh, Francisco Lopez was related to uh, Yacopa, who was the widow of Don Antonio uh, Del Valle, who had once owned this whole area here. She'd since married and become a Salazar. But anyway, uh, Francisco was out here riding up the canyon. He came up from present-day Newhall area with two companions. Uh, their names were Bermudas and Cotta. Uh, long about noontime, Francisco settled down uh, under this oak tree for a little afternoon siesta. Must have been beautiful in the spring with the stream running down and right directly in back of the tree. And, of course, uh, nice and warm, and uh, he would go to sleep. Later he woke up and uh, decided to pluck some wild onions either because his wife had sent him after him. And uh, noticing some growing on a hill over here, he wandered off in that direction uh, for the wild onions. Later on, uh, after the rancho broke up, of course, the, there was the Rainiers that lived here, the uh, Walker family. This was all part of the Walker homestead. Melba Fisher, as you know, was born here in the uh, area. And she recalls uh, playing around the tree, right, Melba? That's you were... right. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. This old tree uh, really brings back many happy memories. As a child, I would crawl through that particular hole there and then right on through and out through this other hole. We children used to play hide-and-go-seek, and we'd chase each other in and out of the old tree. Like a series of turtles. Uh, that, that's right, yes, absolutely. Why don't we go over and see the site where the gold was actually discovered, okay? Yeah, just a few feet up here. Thank you. Now, where is the site, Melba, that you said for the gold was first discovered? Right here. Right between these two trees here. Now, how, how do we dis establish that this is the exact spot? You were telling me. Yeah, earlier. okay, I'll tell you why. Because when they had the dedication way back in uh, 1928, a little lady who was the uh, niece of Francisco Lopez said when she was a tiny little girl, her uncle uh, Don Francisco always wanted to let somebody know the exact spot where he found the nuggets. So. He took her by the hand and brought her up here and said, okay, now this is exactly where I discovered the gold, right here. And that was in the March the 9th, 1842, of course. Okay? Thank you. Jerry, now we really know where it is. Yeah, and Not remember you heard it here first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Can't you just imagine the color and drama that went on here? the clatter of sabers rattling as horsemen rolled across these plains, horses pounding and troops lined up in long lines in front of the barracks. Here would come the Butterfield Overland stagecoach clattering and rattling over the pass. Here too, grizzly and grizzled old prospectors on their way to the Kern River gold rush. Long lines of Conestoga wagons bearing homesteaders and other settlers to the west. And over it all, the mighty Fort Tejon nestled in the valley with the green hills surrounding it. It is a beautiful location and steeped in a dramatic history. We're standing here next to the historic old Mitchell Adobe located on San Can Lost Canyon Road at Sand Canyon in Canyon Country. It was built by Colonel Thomas Findlay Mitchell in 1860. Mitchell himself lived an interesting and colorful life. He was born in Virginia in 1827, came to Texas with his parents, and during the Mexican-American War was elevated to the rank of colonel by no less a personage than General Sam Houston himself. After the war, Mitchell came to California. He panned for gold up on the American River, settling in San Bernardino, where he met his wife, Martha, who had come across the country in a wagon train. A few years later, the year of 1860, the couple came out here. They built this small adobe home, and here they settled down to raise horses, cattle, and children. Martha uh, was sort of a school teacher, and she started teaching some of the neighborhood children in this small adobe house. These included such people as the Cunos and the Langs. John Lang uh, lived about oh, a mile and a half uh, down canyon from where we're standing now at a place called Lang Station. 
between Mrs. Lang and Mrs. Mitchell. They would operate six months here and six months at Lang's, uh, establishing what became known as the Sulphur Springs School District. It is the second oldest school district in the county, and this building may be the oldest existing schoolhouse in Southern California. In the old days, before the Civil War, when you arrived in the Santa Clarita Valley, you either went over the top of the mountain and came crashing down the far side, or you employed the services of Henry Clay Wiley's Windlass. This is a painting of Wiley's Windlass. Uh, Henry Clay opened a saloon and stage stop down at the base of what would later be called Beale's Cut or Fremont Pass. And to get there, you were actually lowered on pulleys down the side of the hill, sort of swinging between heaven and earth. By the time you arrived at Mr. Wiley's stage stop, even if you're a confirmed teetotaler, you probably needed a drink after that. Henry Clay Wiley sold his establishment to twin brothers from Machias, Maine, Sanford and Cyrus Lyon. Lyon was the more adventurer of the two, Cyrus that is. He got himself involved in several shooting scrapes in Los Angeles and was quite a report and noted lawman. Cyrus Sanford was a little more sedate. Together, though, they ran the Lion Station stage stop, which became quite a well-known hostelry in early California. Edward Fitzgerald Beale was born in Washington, D.C., the son of a long line of naval heroes. It was no accident that he entered the Naval Academy and became a midshipman serving during the Mexican-American War. He made the famous long crawl from the Battle of San Pasquale out to San Diego to relieve troops as a very young man. Later in life, he established Fort or the Tejon Cattle Empire. It was 300,000 acres stretching from modern day Gorman almost to Bakersfield. Beale, when he was asking for his reappointment as Surveyor General of California, must have rankled President Lincoln just a little bit because Lincoln replied, I will not have a surveyor who becomes monarch of all he surveys. Poor Beale was promptly fired, but he had other things on his mind. Beale went down and talked with the Board of Supervisors for Los Angeles County. They agreed to give him $5,000 to improve the road between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. Beale pocketed the money, went up to Fort Tejon, and called out the troops. It was the soldiers who came down and whacked a 90-foot deep slash through the mountain barrier uh, known as Fremont Pass, but from this day forward would be known as Beale's Cut. After Beale got the pass dug for nothing and five thousand dollars in his pocket he had the audacity to set up a toll house at the bottom of the grade he charged three cents for sheep that came through and up to two dollars for teams of wagons the old toll house is gone now and Beale's cut is pretty quiet but behind me we can see the way it looks today Beals Cut, the historic gateway between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. For years, the only way you could get out of town was through this cut. Originally, the Spanish explorers called it El Camino Viejo, the old road, later the San Fernando Pass. Finally, Fremont Pass, when John Charles Fremont popped over there and came down this way, and later Beals Cut, when General Beale had the troops from Fort Tejon dig the cut that you're looking at now. It was the route of the Butterfield Overland Stagecoach from St. Louis to Los Angeles, only 21 miles. Earlier than that, in 1854, was the route taken by Phineas Banning, supplying Fort Tejon and also the Kern River Gold Rush. Finally, the old road was bypassed in 1910. A tunnel was built, and then that too is gone. 1939, they took the tunnel away, and now the whole thing is bypassed by Sierra Highway, which is to my right, and by Interstate 14, which is to my left. And now Beals Cut lays lonely, forgotten, windblown, a relic of the past, a gateway to nowhere. Tiburcio Vasquez, and what a more fitting place to look at a picture of this famous outlaw than here in the center of Vasquez Rocks, site of a county park. This is a place where you can bring your family to enjoy a picnic and think of all the exploits of famous Tiburcio that happened over the years. Tiburcio, born in Monterey, California in 1835, started his career at a fairly young age. At age 16, while attending a dance, a constable was killed and he and his friends 
took off and went on the lam. His career spanned approximately 20 years throughout the state, from northern to southern California, and back and forth between. This was one of his hideouts here in the rocks. Jerry, perhaps you could tell us a story or two about Tiburcio. Well, Vasquez, I guess, was most famous for his hit-and-run guerrilla-type warfare that he practiced. He put together a small band of outlaws, and they would raid through Southern California, then they'd disband and hide. And then they'd pop up again in Central, and then again in Northern California, each time with a different group of people. Uh, his most renowned exploits were taking the city of, or I shouldn't say city, it was a village then of Tres Pinos, and also the village of Kingston. Uh, these were both in 1873. Kingston, he actually took over the whole town, tied up all the male citizens, then calmly walked out with everything that wasn't nailed down. The governor was so excited that he uh, put an $8,000 bounty on Vasquez's head, but it was still quite a while before he was finally run to ground. That happened down here in North Hollywood, and uh, partly because of his interest, you might say, in women, uh, Vasquez's romantic liaisons were legion. Uh, there was a lady down in Los Angeles by the name of La Canea, which he seemed to enjoy. Uh, that means rabbit in Spanish, and I guess the less said about that, the better. Vasquez uh, was visiting with a friend, Greek George Allen, down in uh, North Hollywood when uh, the Greek made a mistake, he went to town and left his wife uh, there to entertain Tiburcio. Uh, she was doing such a bang-up job of it that he never noticed the sheriff's posse surrounding the place, so he was captured. He was taken to town with all the uh, fanfare of a modern hero, you might say, and it's kind of hard to believe in this day and age that women would actually go into his jail cell and hang doilies on the tables, put uh, lampshades in and hang curtains by the windows, and that men would bring him bottles of whiskey or that the sheriff would let him get away with it but they actually did uh, might be interesting uh, there's some photographs here if you can get in on them uh, which were taken of Vasquez after his capture and uh, the interesting thing about him is that Vasquez called in a uh, photographer and the man took the pictures and then Vasquez had postcards made and sold them for 25 cents a piece uh, also on the other side of this we have another postcard that was made up uh, showing Sheriff Roland up here at the top the little house where Vasquez was captured and the men who captured him unfortunately Tiburcio was buried uh, in 1875 after being hung and uh, the lower part down here shows an actual invitation to the hanging of Tiburcio Vasquez. It was a social occasion. Oh yeah, a big event, you know, bring the wife and kids and a picnic lunch and watch a guy get hung. There are tales uh, even today of uh, buried gold out here at Vasquez Rocks, which I really seriously doubt. I think that he spent it far faster than he took it in. And uh, for those that like uh, little tales of the supernatural, there have been years legends of the place being haunted of a small Mexican man riding around on a big Palomino horse uh, after hours through here. And uh, maybe so. It's an interesting story anyway, isn't it? Yeah, you can go on with Vasquez stories for hours and hours, but I don't think we have that much time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jerry. We'll see you. An interesting place, isn't it? And think of all the legends and all the stories that center in this area. Let's go on to something else. War with the United States came in the 1840s, and Mexico gradually lost her empire to the north. California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all became Yankee territories. John Charles Fremont marched down from Northern California, camped here for three days where we're standing now, helped himself liberally to some cattle and grain, then marched over the hills below us through Fremont Pass to North Hollywood. There he met with General Andreas Pico, accepting the surrender of California in what is known as the capitulation of Coenga. California, by 1850, was part of the United States of America. Of course, this was the era of the great gold rush. 
the only uh, contact we had around here with the great gold rush up north was two men, William Manley and John Lewis, who came walking in 250 miles across blazing desert to the Davai Rancho here to get aid. They were given food and fruit, horses, and back out across the plains they went, through the mountains and deserts to rescue what was called the Bennett Arcade Party. These people were saved through Del Valle generosity, and as they left, they turned around and said, Goodbye, Death Valley, and that's how the valley got its name. Other than that, uh, the Del Valles lived pretty much the same as they had before. Under the treaty negotiations with Mexico, the natives here were granted full rights to all their property. The only catch was they had to prove that they owned it, and this proved very costly. Litigation sometimes drug on for years. It was all right when times were good, but during the 1860s, a disastrous drought struck. At this time, many of the cattle died, thousands and thousands of head of them. In Los Angeles County alone, 78 percent of the cattle herds were wiped out because of drought. The Mexican ranchers then began selling off their properties, and this is when the Yankees took over. No exception was the Rancho San Francisco. It went through a number of owners until 1875, when an auctioneer from San Francisco arrived. His name was Henry Mayo Newhall. A few years later, in 1878, he built this home that we're at now. He was added on to in the 1890s by his son, Henry Gregory Newhall, and was always the home, the ranch house, the headquarters of the Newhall Ranch, later known as Newhall Land and Farming Company. It has undergone alterations and improvements. There was electricity in it. Down here you can see where gas was added, pumped into it at a later date. It was thoroughly modern and occupied, at least by the ranch foremans, until the 1960s when the property was taken over by Magic Mountain. Since then, it's pretty much gone downhill, and you can see it's in a rather dilapidated condition today. We're sitting here in the living room of the Newhall home in Piru this afternoon. I'd like to introduce to you Scott and Ruth Newhall. Scott is the great grandson of Henry Mayo Newhall for whom our town was named. What can you tell us about your, your family, Scott, or Ruth, whichever would like to respond? Well, Ruth actually probably knows a little more about it because she's written a book on the subject. And all I've done is, has been heard all the family legends and so on and so forth. But I can tell you I've heard a great deal about my great-grandfather, but I never had the pleasure of meeting him because he was somewhat older than I. And uh, But I met most of his sons who were also very much involved with the ranch down here. Mm -hmm. And now we've come along to about the third or fourth generation, and by this time, as you know, it's, what is it, from <laughs> shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, in this case, four or five generations, but here we all are. And I don't know, Ruth can probably give you a very quick thumbnail a biography of Henry and how this all came about, just as well or faster than I can, if you want to go ahead with Oh, that. I would love that. Could you do that for us? Uh, yes, where did, uh, I think you have heard from some other people, where did, did they tell about the Del Valle Rancho? The no, we really, we really didn't go into that. That's where the property originated from yes. the uh, yes. Del Yes, I, th I think the, I think the uh, background of it is that the, uh, most of California, Southern California, was divided up into Spanish or Mexican land grants. And this particular area, the Santa Clarita Valley, uh, all the way down to Piru, was granted to Antonio del Valle, who was in charge of, of distributing the land that had belonged to the San Fernando Mission. Now, this was in 1839, while this territory was still a part of Mexico. And the del Valle family took possession of the Santa Clarita Valley as their private estate. Um, Antonio, unfortunately, died a year after he got it, but his heirs lived on, and this huge 48,000-acre ranch, that's 75 square miles, um, extended 
well, they didn't survey it very carefully. They just sort of assumed that the whole Santa Clarita Valley from about the opening of Soledad Canyon all the way to Piru belonged to the Del Valles. Then when California became a state, it was surveyed, and the ranch uh, went sort of from hilltop to hilltop. Uh, the, if you stand in the middle of the valley and look both ways, it went to both mountaintops, down to Piru, and up today to up Soledad Canyon Road to uh, and Bouquet Canyon, about to where the aqueduct crosses. Oh, yes. Uh, the big pipeline that mm -hmm. comes across. That is yeah. about the terminal side of the uh, formalized land grant. You see, after California became a state, all the land had to be surveyed. The Del Valles had their title confirmed just in time to go broke, as nearly all the California rancheros did. They overspent, buying luxuries, uh, their crops failed, they went through a drought, and they had to sell. Well, the crops were mostly cattle, and when it didn't rain, then the crops failed. Yes, that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the cattle. The cattle yeah. and a little bit of corn for yeah. the household, but basically cattle was what they raised. This was a cattle ranch, and thank you for well, correcting me No, it's me a there. good crop. It's a better crop when there are oil wells to, on which the cattle can graze in the shadow of the derricks, but well, that's, that comes later. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anyhow, the um, uh, ranch was sold at, uh, and an, an oil company, you brought it up at the right moment, right. an oil company bought it, but they didn't pay for it. They just paid a down payment like so many large land deals, and they didn't discover oil on it. And so the oil was all over the hill in Pico Canyon. And they thought. And so they didn't find any oil, and they defaulted, and it went up for a sheriff's sale in 1875. All right, I'll go back a little bit, may I, with Henry Mayo sure, Newhall, please. which you asked about in the first place. Uh, here we have this land sitting here, and now I'll go back to Henry Mayo Newhall, who was a man born in um, uh, Saugus, Massachusetts, in 1825. Now, his family had been at that time in Saugus for eight generations. Saugus, Massachusetts. Is Saugus, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yes. His family had come there 195 years before he was born. He was the eighth generation to be born there, and it's a miracle he left because none of his ancestors ever did. But apparently he was footloose, got restless, uh, moved out. Uh, went to the Philippines as a cabin boy, came back, did all these things beginning at age 13, so that he was 25 and had lived in Philadelphia, in Georgia, and finally in Tennessee, which was then the great frontier, uh, when gold was discovered in California. And um, at that point, he joined the gold rush. And um, he left his bride. He got married about two months before he left and headed for California via the canal. Now, he had made a lot of money as an auctioneer. Um, those were the days when they did not have wholesale dealers on the frontier. Uh, all they had were wagon trains that would arrive with goods, and then a local auctioneer took care of selling them, selling whatever the wagon. They never knew what was coming. And so the auction business was the wholesale business of the day. And the ships. Well, that was, in, I'm talking about Tennessee oh, now. Yeah. yeah. When he came to California, of course, the same thing prevailed, except the goods came by ship. There was no railroad. He didn't find any gold, but he found that his talents as an auctioneer were very much in demand as these great shiploads of merchandise would arrive and needed someone uh, very experienced to sell them. He was 25 years old and almost immediately began making a fortune. Um, he eventually was the president of a company that built the first railroad out of San Francisco. The Southern Pacific Company bought it when he was about 45, and he began to look around for new fields to conquer. He had been very successful. He had $2 million in the bank, and he wanted to invest it in something, and he decided to invest it in land. He bought about eight California ranchos, among them the 
Rancho San Francisco, um, which is uh, this one. Yes, what this, we're yes, yes. Right. this one. The, the Del, Rancho San Francisco. The Del Valle New Ranch here. was um, called the Rancho San Francisco. And um, he bought it at auction for $5 an acre. As I said, it was 75 square miles. And he immediately decided he was going to make a great success out of it, that he would um, start growing crops. Um, he grew some very successful crops. And then he died. He died in 1882. Uh, meanwhile, he, the first thing he had done when he got the ranch was to deed a track, a right-of-way through for the Southern Pacific, which was looking for a way to get trains from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They had got them as far as Mojave and didn't have any way to get them into Los Angeles. So he deeded the right-of-way, which is where the present tracks are, coming down Soledad and up over uh, through where the present town of Newhall. And um, at the time, it was also customary to deal to the railroad a township, a square mile of land on which a town could be built. Well, the Southern Pacific accepted the square mile of land and said, this will be the town of Newhall. And that's how the town of Newhall got its name. He saw that, um, the, he thought the idea of a town was very good, so um, immediately adjacent to it, a little bit uh, north and west, uh, also along the railroad track, where it was much more practical for the trains to stop because Newhall is an, on an uphill grade. Um, he established his own station and town of Saugus, named after his birthplace in Massachusetts. When he died in 1882, his will left his estate to his wife and his five sons. And his uh, five sons uh, ranged in age for, at the time from about 18 to 30. And uh, they incorporated um, the whole, all, not only this ranch, but all the ranches. As I said, there were eight ranches throughout California, um, throughout mostly Southern California, uh, which were incorporated under the title of the New Hall Land and Farming Company, which was totally owned by the five sons and their mother. Um, over the years, that remained in family hands. Some, uh, one son died childless, um, some had many children, uh, some went broke, some, their fortunes varied greatly, but they were all held together by the common bond of this family company. But during their vicissitudes, some acquired a great deal of stock, some acquired very little, some lost all they had. So the shares among the Newhall family began to vary and dissipate. And by the time it reached the uh, fifth generation, there became some Newhalls that were no longer a part of the family. Um, a part, of, a part of the company. Part of the company. company. I'm sorry. Yeah. Part of the New Hall Well, that happens in families yes, too. Yes, that's right. right. No, but, they're all pretty. They're but, pretty but the, much involved. But the the family was the family was close. Mm -hmm. um, everyone, we are now. Up, you mentioned you are the fourth generation. We are now up to the sixth or seventh. The seventh generation has mm -hmm. had its first baby. Um, with Henry Mayo Newhall the first, and we're now down to his, to sev his seventh generation descendant, mm -hmm. so that uh, naturally a family it changes, and it's amazing that everybody is more or less in touch with each other and knows who each other are. There are a few of them that are still extremely active with the Newhall Land and Farming Company. Um, there are a great many that are still stockholders, uh, but about 10 years ago, it became a public company. Yes. And um, 
over the years, it has sold off some of the land for development, for various purposes. It expanded out of its farming. Um, it just generally has grown and changed, and that is Henry Mayo Newhall's legacy. When Henry Mayo Newhall bought the place that would later become known as the Newhall Ranch or Newhall Land and Farming Company, he might have known something that few people knew at the time, and that was that the railroad was coming right up through the Santa Clarita Valley. It was in 1876 when they built between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Along the way was the great San Fernando Tunnel, boring through the mountains at 6,950 feet. It was the third longest tunnel in the world at the time. Out at Lang Station in Soledad Canyon, 5,000 Chinese hammered their way up one side and down the other of the Soledad Canyon, finally coming together at a place called Lang Station. There, a golden spike was driven by Charles Crocker on September the 5th, 1876. After that, everybody went down to Los Angeles for a grand feast at the big hotel, and from then on, trains, engines, cars have rolled up and down the Santa Clarita Valley. The engine I'm standing on is part of that heritage. It was built in 1900 in Schenectady, New York. Southern Pacific ran it up and down here for 57 years. Then it was sold to Gene Autry. He used it at his Melody Ranch for a number of movies and television shows. And then, well, it sort of went through a fire and became somewhat uh, abandoned, disoriented. And finally, it was donated to the Santa Clarita Valley Historical Society, where it's presently being renovated. In 1887, Southern Pacific Railroad built a train station up at the junction of its line with the Ventura spur line that ran clear up into the Santa Barbara region. A station called the Saugus Depot was established at that time. Since there was already a new hall, the station was named for the birthplace of Henry Mayo New Hall, Saugus, Massachusetts. The first station agent was a fellow named Alexander Isaac Frazier, who lived in the top part of the station, that upper part that you can see down below us there. There are a number of notable visitors at one time or another, including President Benjamin Harrison, Theodore Roosevelt, and Herbert Clark Hoover. Finally, Southern Pacific abandoned the station and it was going to be torn down until a historical society got involved with it. Through a tremendous uh, community outpouring, some $60,000 was raised, not only by big corporations donating huge sums, but little kids kicking in nickels, dimes, and quarters. The station finally moved three, down, three miles down the road from Saugus to its present location in William S. Hart Park, Newhall. It is now open on weekends as a museum, and if if you'd like, we'll go down and we'll take a look inside of the Saugus Depot. Scott Newhall has discussed his illustrious ancestor. We have seen the trains coming into the Santa Clarita Valley. I thought it might be nice at this moment to pause and take a look at Henry Mayo Newhall himself. This photograph is contained in a book written by Ruth Newhall called the, what else, Newhall Ranch. The town, of course, was not named by Henry M. Newhall. It was named by the Southern Pacific Railroad. It was a train depot originally up around where the Saugus area is today. Because of a declining water supply system, the whole town moved southward uh, in 1878 and relocated at what is now Market and Railroad Avenue. Behind me are some pictures of old Newhall on the wall. This is a lithograph done in 1878 showing what is supposed to be downtown Newhall. You can see the Newhall sheds for the depot right in through here, the train just pulling in. At that same time, Henry Mayo Newhall built the Southern Hotel, which is located right here. This line running right through the lobby of the hotel would be today's Market Avenue. Coming down across the back would be Newhall Avenue, uh, as it is today. I tend to think that this lithograph might be somewhat exaggerated because we have an actual photograph of the hotel taken sometime between 1878 when it was built and 1888 when it burned to the ground, and there it stands right there. The hotel stood for 10 years between 1878 and 1888, which time it burned to the ground. 
Here is the main street of Newhall, a very busy, crowded Saturday afternoon, no doubt. The little structure way back here in the back, way outside of town, so it would be away from civilized folks, is the schoolhouse. That school was built in 1887 and burned down in 1890, so we know approximately when the photograph was taken. Main Street is composed of a couple of general merchandises and four saloons. One of the uh, more prominent saloons, more or less catering to the oil men of the times, was known as the Oil Exchange. The Oil Exchange was a well-known hangout for local, mainly oil men. This was located about 6th Street and San Fernando Road in today's New Hall. After Tiburcio Vasquez was hanged in 1875, the Los Angeles Board of Supervisors decided that we needed law and order out here. At that time, uh, the Soledad Judicial District was established, and the first judge of the Soledad was John F. Powell, a native of Galway, Ireland. Powell had been ranching over in the Big Rock area, did such an outstanding job uh, making treaties with the Indians that they brought him in here to handle the uh, Soledad Judicial Judicial District, which was actually established May 5th, 1875. The photograph you're looking at shows the judge right here with his wife, Flora, and their children out gardening at the house next, uh, in fact, right across the street from the uh, Saugus train depot. The judge lived for many years, finally passing away in 1923. He was the oldest judge in the uh, Los Angeles judicial system at the time of his death. Meet Mr. Ed Pardee, who came to the Newhall area from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was involved in oil drilling out there and was asked by Charles Alexander Metry to come to Pico Canyon to help with the drilling operations in that region. Ed moved into town about 1897 and bought this house. It was called the Good Templar's Lodge. And if you look behind Ed's head, between he and the horse, that building is still standing on Market Street in Newhall. It's our present Santa Cruz. Valley Chamber of Commerce office. Ed had a good eye for horse flesh and actually owned the livery stable here in town. Ed's livery stable certainly seemed to be the place to be in the 1890s and early 1900s. This was located on Railroad Avenue about directly behind the New Hall hardware store today. The last of these pictures in a row was taken along about 1910 in downtown Newhall. The General Merchandise Store was originally built by George Campton. It was the first store in Newhall and dates back to 1876. By 1907, he sold out to Nick Lindenfield and Frank Landell. And it looks just the same as it did in the 1870s. But here we are, strolling down Newhall Avenue along about 1910. In 1887, Newhall got a neighbor three miles up the road, in fact, in the very spot where Newhall used to be. The Saugus train station was built at that time when the spur line was connected over to Ventura. This photograph was taken along about 1910 or before the back of the postcard that it came from anyway was dated 1910. Saugus, Cafe, um, Saugus Station, uh, sort of a self-contained community, you might say, shortly after it opened, uh, there was a little business established called Tolafree's Eating House. In 1898, Tolafree's sold out to the Woods family, and this was the beginning of what today is known as Saugus Cafe. Here's the Woods family standing out in front of the Saugus Station and also their Saugus Cafe. Uh, that's Martin Wood on the far left, Richard Wood, and their wives. Just behind this picture, we have a second shot of the Saugus Station taken shortly after the Woods family took over. Which you can see right here. In fact, there's Martin Wood standing out in front of the station greeting travelers. Eventually, the uh, Saugus Cafe, in fact, 1905, moved out of the station and across the street to the location where it's still at. For a great number of years, the south end of Saugus, at least, was known as Surrey, 
or a Burqa built uh, Surrey General Store and Hotel and one thing and another down there. There was postmarked. There were a lot of letters floating around from Surrey. By the time this picture was taken, 1929, Surrey was pretty much folded or phased out, and Saugus uh, was the general name for the community. Uh, this is some sort of traffic jam. Perhaps people on their way over to Hoot Gibson's Rodeo Arena, which is now known as the Saugus Speedway. Uh, one of the more unusual trains to pull in to the Saugus train station was a gas-powered locomotive, uh, which many people referred to as a galloping goose. These were maintained only for a very few years, between about 1906 and 1928. This photograph was taken in 1924. Last in this series, downtown Saugus as it appeared in the 30s. The Saugus Cafe hasn't changed much. The uh, drugstore was located about where the old Surrey Inn was situated. Meet Charles Alexander Mentry, who was actually born in France. In 1845, at the age of seven, he was brought to this country by his parents, his father, Peter Mentry, being employed in the oil fields around Titusville, Pennsylvania. Mentry grew up with oil in his veins, you might say, and when the fields began petering out back east, he drifted to San Francisco, landing in 1875. He was employed with several drilling companies working in Placerita Canyon and Pico Canyon, finally working for Pacific Coast Oil Company. It was in 1876 that Charles Alexander Mentry rigged up a three-pole derrick and began drilling a hole in Pico Canyon. Uh, Mentry drilled in Placerita and came up with white oil. You may ask, what's white oil? Well, take a look at this. White oil comes up out of the ground in a refined condition, just as you see it here. It's so clear you could actually read a newspaper through it. It was displayed in Philadelphia during the 1876 centennial celebration, and it was quite a hit back there, especially in those oil-rich regions. White oil uh, can be used right out of the ground. It doesn't have to be refined. You can pour it into a kerosene lantern, use it to heat your house. In fact, as late as the 30s, uh, Tommy Walker was driving his tractor by using white oil and just dumping it right into the vehicle and letting it run the way it is. The wells have pretty much died out. Uh, this is about one day's production uh, back there in Placerita Canyon.